as somebody who lives in District 10 and has shown up up to a land use meeting, you are in fact a member of the land use committee. So congratulations on this uh, this mantle of membership that you are now wearing, flowing beautifully behind you. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. When we have uh, any kind of motion, you are you are welcomed and encouraged to vote on that as long as you are a member. Um, and I'm going to pause Mark what? and Liz's iPad. Can I ask you to mute yourself? And Liz's iPad looks unmuted too, whoever that is. Um, so know that as motions come up or if there is any kind of a vote that as long as you are a District 10 resident, you are welcomed and encouraged to participate. Shevik has put a link to our agenda in the chat there. Uh, and so you can click on that. You can kind of see a roadmap of where we're going. Um, I'm generally gonna try to not share that because I like to be able to see folks on the screen rather than just screen sharing the whole time. So I'm gonna keep that down for right now. Um, I'll take just a minute to introduce myself. My name is Maggie Zimmerman. Um, I'm one of our District 10 Como Community Council board members and I chair our land use committee. Um, we have several other board members here tonight in addition to some community guests. Uh, I'm not gonna go through introductions, not because I don't love you all, but because we are on a time frame tonight. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna ask if there are any objections to approving the agenda as it stands. So there are, the agenda was linked in the chat there. Are there any objections to approving the agenda as it stands? Going once, going twice. Okay. Um, then we will, with uh, with no objection, we will approve the agenda. Uh, and I want to start off by asking if there are any particular business items from the community that we might want to add to our agenda tonight after our speakers have had a chance to talk with us. So any new topics or concerns to find a place for in our agenda tonight? If I may um, speak, my name is yes. Sophia Leike. Um, thank Hi, you Sophia. for the invitation. Yeah, um, so I have been in contact with a few, a few people from the city of St. Paul about a recent um, incident in my neighborhood, um, a shooting, um, and uh, our concerns um, about, you know, the, the traffic in our neighborhood, which uh, I understand seem unrelated, but we think that if um, the traffic uh, is lessened, or I guess that what I've been hearing today is traffic calming. If there are traffic calming, um, you know, ways to kind of deal with this, it it will I think necessarily decrease the the incident that happened, the chances of the incident that happened recently in my neighborhood, and okay. that is. Um, you know, a shooting, um, you know, in front of my next door neighbor's house. I live at 1560 Holton um, at the corner of Holton and Hoyt uh, in between Snelling and Hamlin Avenue. Okay. And yep, I, and reached I, I remember now that I was copied on these emails that came around today. So yes, um, Sophia, we will, we've got some presenters here, but I would like to, as long as we've got time, um, when we are done with our grand round presentation from David uh, from Parks and Rec, then I'd like to uh, spend some time talking about some traffic calming and some of the options that we had in that email exchange today. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Anybody else have uh, any topics or concerns that they'd like to see if we can find a little bit of time for tonight? All right. Seeing none, <clears throat> we are going to, we're going to move on, but we're going to move back. Um, to some old business. So uh, several months ago, um, kind of as the summer season was getting kicked off, uh, we were hearing from uh, a couple folks in the neighborhood that they were struggling with sort of irregular noise from um, music and events at the pavilion. And we know that this is sort of a really uh, important part of our community. It's certainly you know, a gem in our crown, um, and it provides a gathering place for the community. What we also want to be cognizant of is that we're all residents and neighbors, 
uh, both businesses, organizations, um, and large music venues like this. And so we reached out uh, to the operators at Dock and Paddle, as well as Parks and Rec, to kind of talk about how they were monitoring sound uh, from that establishment and um, how we were kind of making sure that there was some consistency around that. And so tonight, uh, we're following up on that, and we have Tony Arvidson from Dock and Paddle and Lancer Catering that runs Dock and Paddle, as well as Tyler McKean uh, from the St. Paul Parks and Rec Program. Um, and or I'm sorry, he's a park, he's a program supervisor through Parks and Rec. Uh, and so I actually am going to turn it over to them. And Tony, if you're if you are available, um, I I'm going to give you the stage first to just talk a little bit about. Um, what what it looks like from your perspective and kind of what Doc and Paddle has been up to. Yeah, and I might uh, take this opportunity to hop in. Tony and I sure. kind of connected beforehand and okay. figured, you know, I'd give you the parks and recreation perspective because um, we own the building. Uh, we executed the contract with uh, Lancer Catering and, um, you know, ultimately, the the city is in charge of what happens out there or determining what happens and then yeah. Lancer is our partner in executing that plan. Take it um, away Tyler, thank you. So thank you, uh, Tyler McCain, I work for the Parks Department, um, uh, overseeing contracts and agreements. Uh, so working with partners like Lancer and um, others to get them in place and then hopefully be successful once they, once they are in place. Um, so hopefully I'm uh, tackling this in the way that everybody kind of expected me to kind of talk about what's happened out there, what's going on now, uh, what, what our intentions are and things like that. And then Tony can add on to anything that I miss and tell you a little bit more about Dock and Paddle specifically. Um, so uh, Lancer has been in, I'm not gonna go into super, great uh, or super long history uh, with this property. Uh, some of you probably know it better than even Tony and I do, um, but Lancer has been our contracted partner there since 2019, and I've been in my role since early 2020. So for a little context of what I know and what I've experienced, uh, that's kind of the time frame that we're talking about. You know, and obviously during that time, uh, it was not business as usual especially in 2020 and 2021. Um, and even in 2019, Lancer came in sort of late in the game um, in the springtime. Uh, so they didn't have a lot of time to ramp up. So that's all just to say that things have been a little weird for the last few years. Uh, and 2022 here is really the first operating year where we felt like we really, both parties have our, our feet on the ground, both feet on the ground, um, uh, and we can plan for things uh, to be somewhat normal uh, and adjust as we go through them. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's worthwhile to note that in 2020 and 2021, the activity around that property was very much muted. Um, and I didn't intend for that to be a noise reference, but uh, I think it's appropriate. Um, so, you know, with, with ramping up normal activity there again, with more music in the parks um, and more private events, uh, you know, we sort of anticipated that some people would, uh, you know, perceive, well, let me say it a different way. Uh, more sound has been coming uh, from that property than has the last couple of years. Uh, and we knew that would be the case going in to this year. And we knew that um, some people would have questions about that. Some people might even object to that. Um, and throughout this operating season, we've been trying to fine tune that a little bit. Um, you know, as Maggie laid out at the beginning, it's a wonderful community space. Uh, there's people from all over the city and surrounding community that like to come there um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so we wanna find a nice balance as much as we can um, between getting people out there, activating the space, taking full advantage of that great facility and the surrounding area, 
but also be respectful of neighbors. Uh, and I'm sure you guys can all understand that that's kind of a fine line and the line's not necessarily drawn in the same spot for everybody. Um, so certainly at the beginning of the season, uh, we had some things to figure out. Um, sound is not perceived objectively. Um, it's perceived subjectively. Um, I know this because of every time I turn on the TV after my wife uh, has been watching a movie, I have to turn the volume way down. Um, but, um, you know, we want to find what works well for just about everybody, right? Um, so trying to take a little bit of subjectivity out of it um, and not just saying, hey, is this too loud? Uh, because if you ask that question to 10 different people, you might get 10 different answers. Um, so hopefully what people have experienced over the last few weeks is a more consistent level, uh, sound level coming out of the events that are there um, and an overall appropriate level of sound. Because um, what we're trying to do is, again, this is not a perfect science, uh, but measure the sound from time to time. Um, uh, the Lancer team actually put in quite a bit of work to measure sound at different spots around the lake, um, as well as at the promenade at the same time to see how sound dissipates uh, as it travels across the lake, for example. Um, you know, uh, turns out that no trees, no buildings, no physical obstructions doesn't really dissipate a ton of sound, um, but there is some sound that dissipates over that distance. Um, you know, so taking that into account as, you know, performers are setting up and what have you, um, working with performers and DJs and stuff like that to make sure that they know the expectations, um, you know, and, you know, we're, we're somewhat lucky in that that is a very popular place to get married, to have a performance, to play music for folks. Um, so we've kind of all come to the conclusion that if there's a particular performer, performance group, or DJ um, who's having trouble sticking to the expectations that our partner Lancer puts out for them, we don't necessarily need to have that group back. Um, and that's, that's a little bit of, um, what people might have experienced over the past, because you know, uh, some DJs like to crank it up and get the party going, um, but we know that that doesn't work for everybody in our community. Um, so trying to set reasonable expectations with those groups, um, you know, and still get people out there. I think um, this year they've been extremely successful in booking groups. I think one thing that's maybe different from past partners is that we've got a very organized and responsive partner there in Lancer. So um, they're able to get, you know, 140, 150 events into that space over the course of the year. Um, you know, and I, I will note at this point that the city has set the expectation that Lancer have those music in the park events and concerts and things of that nature. Um, that's written into our contract. So, um, you know, Lancer kind of sort of came into this and Tony can talk about it a little bit more as, uh, you know, a food service uh, company, but uh, now they're kind of in the event business too. Uh, and they've learned a lot over the last few years, um, getting a lot better, but uh, we're really glad to have them there. And we think that we're moving in the right direction and we hope that, you know, the last few weeks, especially um, the month of July and here into August, people have noticed a difference in the consistency uh, and the volume of sound coming out of that spot. Um, so sorry, I've been blabbing on. I know you guys have a tight agenda. Let me pause. Tony can add anything that I forgot. Um, and then we can take any questions that people have. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, just to ducktail a little bit, you know, I think that we've had to pivot on a lot of different levels in the the food and the hospitality. And 
it's it, it is what you hear on TV, news, radio, social media. It's 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 been a punishment uh, past few years, and we've become uh, more nimble at this and better. And um, 2021 was a year where we 2020 and 2021 was you know how can we become an outdoor venue and at the same time be successful with the same type of who we are and what we do. And um, as Tyler said, I think that. You know, as we were more nimble and more willing to book events, you know, one criteria that came to the table quickly was let's expand as much as we can outside and 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 but also be respectful to the community and the neighborhood and uh, it went well it it, 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 it went very well. Um, our bookings went up, I think, in 2020, where we booked um, out of the gate, uh, we did. 150 bookings so that meant theater groups that meant um, clubs associations uh, yeah. nearby uh, companies and it was a public uh, a public gathering and and uh, unfortunately then then COVID hit and we had to turn everything away and and, and figure out how we were going to succeed into that year and and holding some of the events out there but as Tyler mentioned, uh, you know, I would say that DJs were the toughest ones. Uh, we didn't realize just how impactful it was um, <clears throat> and what kind of music can be played during those those fun events that we've all been to. Uh, but, um, you know, things have changed a little here. So we're, we're, we're managing that in a better way. Um, and as we just booked and rebooked our 2020 and 2021 uh, for this year, we were very selective to those that we brought back uh, from 2021, which helped uh, because we knew a little bit more about what the genre was, the music levels, who was more compliant with sort of where we needed to be. And, and uh, as you know, we're in the business also of more long-term booking. So when we, when we work our calendar out, we do it in uh, such an advance notice that you know, you're seven, eight months out um, with some of these and, and not knowing some of them has been a little tricky. So as we started to learn that we got better and, and, um, and listen, we're, we're not perfect. Tyler knows this. Him and I have conversations about this all the time about how we manage these sound levels, because it's important to not just the guests, but also the people in that neighborhood um, and the, and the uh, passerby. So Continue to work on that is going to be our key strategy, uh, but also making sure that 2023 and 2024, we've got the right uh, people coming back. And so an emphasis on more theater groups and more events that provide that family, fun, you know, um, event style is, is really our goal. Um, you know, we had moved uh, spring, we, we had, moved from the Spring Cafe to the Dock and Paddle um, right after COVID in 2021. Uh, it's been a success. We booked a little over 135 events this year, which in April, we were thinking we had maybe 50 because musicians weren't playing. So it, it's it's been fantastic. You know, the five to 700 people that come out to the pavilion are just so joyous about having the opportunity to, to hear free music in the park and to have a cocktail or two is always supporting the, the local uh, Lancer, uh, which we commend everybody to do that. Uh, but family, friends, uh, it, it's it's been a fantastic year. So you know, I can pause and take a few questions if you like, but I, I wanted you to know a little bit about uh, the history, uh, some of the challenges, but more importantly, sort of what we've been working on uh, from a from a music production and a theater, you know, booking for 2023 and 24. So, yeah, thank you, Tony and Tyler, um, for kind of the background and the more recent, like, what are we trying to do? So we'll turn it over to the group for questions. And Anne, you've got your hand up. Uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Maggie. Um, no, I just want to say I live right across from the pavilion, and I rather enjoy the music. My family's owned this house for 80 years. I grew up with the music across there. If you move to a regional park, and this is a regional park, and it needs to be available for everybody, 
um, that goes along with it. If you move next to a cemetery, I can see where you'd have a different expectation for a sound level, but this is a regional park. Um, as you just said, this is a joyous place to be. People have been cooped up for two years. Musicians haven't been able to play. And I sit on my patio and I enjoy every last loud note. My understanding is they're not exceeding um, acceptable decibel levels. So I just wanted to say, I don't know what the problem is, um, but I appreciate the noise. So thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Other questions or comments? I guess uh, one kind of a follow up that I would just have, I know we've got, I'm not sure if we have anybody at the meeting tonight um, who was kind of part of that original group that had some questions about how sound management was happening at the pavilion. Um, I am curious for those who, you know, were really feeling that negative impact if they feel like there has been um, some improvement, you know, over the last month here. So I don't know if anyone present is able to speak to that or not, but if so, please go ahead. It seems like maybe no. And I think to some extent, the fact that they aren't here might mean <laughs> that yeah. some of those- I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, we oh, are here. Okay. We couldn't get uh, off mute there. Yeah, yeah I do think uh, we're across the lake as well. And we've been in touch with Shevik and Tyler. We've had emails back and forth. I do think, I think we have with the group of neighbors that we've been talking to, noticing that it is better um, we still have, I know Tyler had mentioned at one point that the handheld decibel meter would be used and maybe the city would look at an automated um, sound system. Has anything more been looked at with the automated um, use of that? Yeah, I can touch on that. Thanks for the question, Liz. Um, yeah, so I think what you received was sort of, you know, uh, sort of conceptual ideas uh, uh -huh. that we were bouncing around. Um, you know, we do have handheld um, decibel readers on site. Um, also here in 2022, you can download apps for your phone um, that, you know, have some, some decent capability too. Um, so, um, you know, there are some limitations with that. Um, you know, you can only get sound at one point in time whenever you're looking at it. And, uh, it's from wherever you are and um, stuff like that. But that's that's kind of what we've used to, you know, sort of map out the area and how, dis how sound dissipates over time. And that's a tool that, um, you know, is on site at the promenade. So uh, somebody can pull it out and say, oh yeah, you know, it seems like, we're in a good range or uh, they can say to themselves, hey, does this seem a little too loud? And they can pull out that, that decibel reader and adjust. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, every band or every performance uh, is a little bit different uh, with what is creating that sound. Um, so decibel isn't the only thing that goes into it. Um, you know, bass could be particularly aggravating to some people um, played at, you know, what it, I'm not an expert in this area, frequency or volume or what, whatever it is, you know, loud bass, let's just say that. Um, so, you know, we think that we've had some success, like I said, over the last few weeks, um, taking this somewhat low tech approach. Um, so at the, at this moment, we aren't, uh, in the process of purchasing any expensive or, um, uh, to, uh, to new age or crazy, uh, technology to go out there. Um, truthfully, it's pretty cost prohibitive. Um, it would take quite a bit of city resources to get something that could monitor sound constantly, um, either at the promenade across the lake or multiple locations. Um, so if we can do it without spending that money, um, that'd be great. Cause that's, that's resources that we can put into the facility elsewhere. Um, yeah. But certainly, um, you know, we've, we've batted around more than just those ideas that were in that one message that you saw. Um, 
you know, and we've, we've met with the council president, the city council president, Amy Brenmoen on this topic. Um, we've talked with the parks director, Andy Rodriguez, my special services supervisor, Susie Odegaard. And we think that we've got a good plan and we're all committed to um, changing course or adding additional tools or resources if it's determined that, that those would be good. Yeah, because it's all going the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, a, you know, a message that we heard before and kind of while we were trying to communicate, you know, with um, Doc and Paddle with the city on this is that it does help you guys to know if there's a particularly egregious <laughs> night, um, because then as you're planning booking for the future, you know, there's then at least your your booking agent has some idea of, you know, who they need to maybe remind uh, in the future. And so I think there's, you, there's a, there's a fine balance between, you know, understanding that like, it's a large music venue, it's going to make noise. Um, and, and I mean, I, so I live a few blocks north of the lake, I hear it up here, uh, in my own backyard, despite being a few blocks away. And we like it because we can kind of decide like whether or not we're going to walk down based on what flows up to us here. Um, but I think that there's, you know, there's, there are outlets, if people have, you know, future questions or if, um, you know, if concerns arise, but I, I am, I'm heartened uh, to hear that Liz has, you know, seen improvement and that folks feel like they got a little bit better handle on it because uh, we want to have those music, uh, the, all of those different musical groups still being there and, and feeling welcome in our community. Right. Yep. Yeah, and I think that the right balance, it, it, it's finding that right balance. So, you know, I know Ann calls us and tells us to turn the music up, but uh, then we've got the opposite. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, you know, it, it, it's finding the right balance in, in for the promenade. But, but Tyler is right. It, it, it's sometimes we get caught up into these, you know, what the genre is and what the music levels are and what the bass is. And I think once we catch it, we realize, okay, let, let's work on that. But um, sometimes it just is too late and we're busy in the kitchen or something happens, but it's about that right balance. And I think uh, moving forward, we've got a good, we've got good balance of musicians and theater groups um, that will work better. So thank you, Liz, for your comments. Sure. Yep. Are there other questions or comments for Tyler and Tony while we have them here? All right, well, y'all know where to find Tony when you're ready for one of those cocktails uh, down by the lake there. Tyler um, and Tony, we thank you both for your time tonight. Um, I'm sure that we will see you around the block here. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, with that, we are gonna move on to our next agenda item. So we're gonna keep in here our Parks and Rec theme. Um, and thinking about what is happening in our neighborhood and a lot of those very valued outdoor spaces. Um, our next guest is David Ramzani, I hope I said that right, from uh, Parks and Rec. Um, he's a landscape architect and gonna talk to us a little bit about how some of the ongoing brand round uh, uh, kind of adjustments in our neighborhood are happening and what the plans are for that. So Dave, I will turn it over to you and thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Maggie. I hope everybody can hear me all right. I'm, I'm not a big Zoom person. I work for the city, so I'm always doing teams. So if I stumble on here, I apologize. I also have my colleague on here as well. Um, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, he'll be explaining, or he'll be introducing actually the update to the Como uh, Trails Master Plan. So um, that, his name is Max Sell, but I'm here to talk more about the Grand Round nodes. It's a project that is, um, it's really a wayfinding and placemaking component of the Grand Round. And, you know, it was part of, if you think back to 2016, as part of the Grand Round implementation and plan and the design plan, it was, you know, adopted in 2017 by city, city council. I'm going to actually, if it's all right, share my screen. I put a little PowerPoint together. It might help, uh, help you yeah, follow along it. rather than just watch me talk. <laughs> So let's see here. Hopefully I share the correct screen. That's always fun too. 
All right. Hope everybody can see that. Are we good? All right. So the grand round nodes overview. Um, like I said, it's the grand round nodes is just a part of the place making portion of the grand round place making wayfinding, so to speak. Um, that also includes uh, just signage, wayfinding signage, um, identity signage, just interpretive, all those kinds of things. You know, back back when the implementation plan was going on, you know, I was unfortunately not a part of that, but there was an extensive community out, outreach um, uh, outreach program going on, and we received a ton of helpful feedback of that. Um, help describe uh, good locations for uh, these, these nodes, so to speak, along the grand round. Um, there's, there was 10 of them that we ended up reaching on um, and they would be scattered across the 26 mile grand round. Um, and they have three designs. Uh, I will get to the more specifics of my project in a little bit, but in terms of the designs, I mean, they're all, they all follow relatively the same design language. So the same materials, uh, furnishings, they all have a kiosk, um, those kinds of things, you know, and most of them have their class with the seat wall. Most of them are through that design. Um, there's one that's an overlook plaza with seat wall and ornamental railings. I don't know if we even went with one of those yet, but the backdrop plaza and seat wall, that's another one as well. So. My project um, is funded through the 8 to 80 uh, Vitality Initiative. It's uh, an initiative that went back, I think it was way back in 2014. Uh, we had some money left over for that for this specific reason. And we were able to, out of the 10, with the three completed, we are able to fund uh, five more of them, which is great. So we're almost, almost done with that. We have two more after this, I believe. Um, the two that are most uh, uh, concerning, or I guess uh, most affect uh, the Como folks, are the one over by the East, the Lakeside Pavilion, and then East Como Wheelock Park in the Wheelock Parkway. Sorry, I tried to like combine both of those, which didn't work out clearly. Um, the three other ones are off of East Shore Drive and Johnson, so right next to Phelan, um, over at Indian Mounds uh, Regional Park, and then there is one at. Uh, Pelham and MRB. They're all located along the Grand Round. So this slide shows, um, so each one of these little orange dots are where nodes are set up or are proposed to be set up along the Grand Round. The Grand Round actually kind of goes along this large loop here uh, throughout St. Paul. The green dots are the nodes that have been completed. The the one the furthest left over here was actually the one that had been completed last summer, I believe, off of uh, Hamlin and Como Trail. Uh, the five that I'm focusing on is one over at, here's the Pelham, and then we have the two over at Como Pavilion, that intersection, like I told you, and then Phelan and Nemo. So that's just kind of give you a perspective of how, how far reaching these are. So each design, like I mentioned, follows the same general uh, design language. This is just a page directly out of the implementation plan. It shows three versions of the same node. Um, how we land in those versions kind of comes down to the space that's provided, what the site looks like, what kind of funding is available, um, those kinds of things. So each one of these is quite small. They're roughly about 500 square feet. So if you think about 25 by 25, it's actually quite small. Wait, that's not, that's way more than five. Anyways, math. Um, yeah, so like I said before, these node features, um, like a lot, of you, a lot of them, when you go by, you'll see the same sort of things. You know, some of the highlights, not all of them have drinking phones, but some of the highlights are bike repair stations and uh, branded Grand Round uh, bike racks. Uh, there's large Grand Round medallion at the kiosks. Um, most of the kiosks, I won't say all of them, most of them are also solar powered. So, you know, in terms of safety, there is a down shining light on the roof and that'll help just light up the area around it. It's not projected out as much as it is down. 
Um, so it's just it's just to help uh, help highlight it, I guess, as well. So so in terms of like the no design, we'll actually get down yeah, down to it now. Um, the one at the Como Lakeside Pavilion, so the one that is right next to the pavilion that we were just talking about, is this little black dot right here, little black circle. Um, and this page is actually directly from, also directly from the implementation plan. And when you thumb through the plan, you'll see these little icons and they get kind of hard to understand. There's a whole wayfinding matrix uh, further down, but just to try to simplify things for you, I, I put the little circle here to show you the general location where it's supposed to be. And this is a line drawing uh, of what that node is looking like. Um, you have the two seat walls right here, the two short seat walls, right? the trash can, bike racks, there's a little bike fix-it station, and then the kiosk. Each kiosk will have uh, four panels, um, one of which, so they're, they all kind of change through each node, and that's kind of part of it, right? We want these nodes to be and represent different neighborhoods, so those who are riding along the Grand Rounds, not only have a little bit of a rest stop, but they also can learn something along the way, or they can kind of see where they are along uh, the Grand Round, and really in the city, because the Grand Round, you know, expands the majority of the city. Like, you should be able to do a consistent loop, which is kind of amazing. So, you know, at, at this point, there will be four, four panels on each one of them. Um, two constants would be a bike map, uh, of the system bike map and then map the Grand Round. Uh, the other two are usually going to be site specific. So over at Como, we might have something like a history of Como, or we might have a map of Como, or we could, you know, do a special feature over by the pavilion because we also have another node located just on the southeast side of Como over on East Como and Wheelock Parkway. So this one is shaped a little bit differently, um, mainly due to the space that it's in, and it is connected directly adjacent to uh, the existing pathway here. So this one has a slightly longer uh, re little seat wall here, and then the same types of features. So you still have bike racks, one on each side, you got a fix-it station, trash, and then the kiosk. Any questions so far? All right. I will keep going. So those are the two that are in the Como area. I just wanted to do a quick run through to show you what the other ones look like. You know, it's the one over at Phelan, so East Shore and Johnson Parkway is also pretty identical to the other ones, slightly different shape. So this one is situated right. And so this map is, it's not north south. So if you kind of turn your head 90 degrees to the right, you'll see where Phelan is right here. And then the node is situated in this little corner here. So it really connects, or it's kind of a joint area where by the Bruce Vento Regional Trail and St. Paul Grand Round. So the Grand Round is this green, green path going along this way. And then as it veers off, this is when it turns into the Bruce Vento Regional Trail. So, so this node will have more Phelan specific types of things on it. And then this is the one over on Indian Mountains Regional Park. Again, it's, this is <laughs> this map is set up funny. So north, 90 degrees. It's uh, right along here. So it's right at the T intersection of Johnson Parkway and Burns. So once you once you hit this node, you're going to want to take a left to go over to the east and then it'll take you down over to uh, Shepherd Road and continue along the Grand Round. So each, as you'll notice, each one is a slightly different shape. You know, they just follow the topography of the area. This is actually a slightly different node than the rest of them because this kiosk already is existing. And along here, this is just a platform landing area because you know, when you build something directly adjacent to a pathway, you just need to hope that it is properly sloped. So if it's not, then you can start building in concrete areas to make sure that it is properly sloped and everybody can access it comfortably. Oops. And the last but not least, the five nodes is the one over at Pelham East, 
saw some renderings of it from the uh, previous page in the design and implementation plan. Uh, this is really what it looks like, plan view here, with the rear Pelham is right here, it's a T intersection of Mississippi River Boulevard. And so once, once the users are going down MRB, they'll hit this node and then they can go north along the, the furthest west <laughs> north direction of the Grand Round as they head back towards the Homo direction. So again, kiosk, seat walls, bike racks, crash can, and the fix-it station. So in terms of timeline, you know, oops, in terms of timeline, like these nodes are following a 60 day construction timeline, you know, and that that worked out really well, you know, in the beginning of the year when we didn't have nearly as many of those supply chain issues as we do now. So it is a slightly delayed um, and we're working our way through some of these items. Um, however, once we do break ground on the Como Pavilion, location and the one uh, off of the Wheelock intersection, uh, we expect those to get moving pretty quick. I actually told the contractor, since there's so many people that are in those areas to just make those a priority as soon as you break ground. So you can fill in the hole as soon as you can and it'll be um, a minimal disturbance. Um, each one of those locations, I can actually go back real quick. Um, have an alternate pedestrian route. So when this is under construction, I would expect some fencing to be kind of around here, but you still should be able to navigate around it pretty easily. As I said, these are all pretty small. It's not, it's nothing like, you know, we're uh, rebuilding a parking lot on these ones. And this one, we would expect this side of the segment of trail to be closed, you know, where the island is. So you can easily walk around that and stay out of the way. So, um, each of the nodes are currently under construction simultaneously, give or take. It's just kind of when the contractor is getting to them. So um, hopefully they will be done and everything will be great. We'll have all the concrete we need. We'll have all the masonry we need um, by, you know, by the time the snow flies. i hoping it'll be October, like I said supply chain and you know some some things are just getting crazier as we go so that is the end of my spiel does anybody have any questions yeah and go ahead where did you say the money for these is coming from so that's from the 8 to 80 vitality fund so that was that was an initiative that uh, was done several years ago, um, more than several years ago in like 2013 and 14. And we've been working on projects from that fund for some time. So it was the main funder of the uh, design and implementation plan. And as well as uh, the first 2016 segment of Wheelock Parkway, um, the signage throughout the Grand Round, um, it's actually, it, it's funding most, well, I wouldn't say most things Grand Round, I would say just about well, Dickerman Park as well. So um, a lot of the Grand Round items are funded through uh, the 8 to 80 Vitality Fund. You know, a lot, if I talk about Wheelock Parkway, a lot of those segments were actually done with, you know, public works money in um, like Como Avenue Trail, stuff like that, so. Okay, so um, that money was in a fund from several years ago. Are you going to hit a cost overrun? Because um, reportedly things are a lot more expensive now. Well, we have actually bid it back in spring. So we know exactly how much uh, things should cost. Okay, so spring we, of this year? This year, yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. So, so I'm at the moment, I'm pretty comfortable with things. So. Well, is there a, a, a plan B if you run out of funding? Oh. Well, the um, at this point, the fund for the full design and construction of these has been accounted for. So we're not like in the bidding process where we can, you know, open open up the bids and oh geez, we're forty thousand over. 
So unless there's like a huge, like something big happens, let's cross our fingers. We don't dig in St. Paul and find something that we don't want to find. Um, we should be pretty comfortable, but it's construction. So we'll see. And the one thing that we have going for us too is they're all very small sites. Okay, right. And I know that, but I'm just going to say that um, if there's a budget, I think a lot of citizens would be appreciative if you stuck to the budget. Absolutely. That's the goal. Are there other questions out there? All right. Dave, if you can, I'm going to have you stop sharing your screen so that I can see folks and just make sure I'm not missing any other hands up or okay. something like that. There we go. I was hitting buttons and I finally got it. That's okay. I'm lucky if I get there myself. Yeah. Any also, additional... yeah, go ahead. one more thing. I mean, if anyone wants to contact me, uh, you can either look at the city website or I can just send me uh, Meg or Shevik, my contact info. And, you know, I'm always open to feedback, emails, questions, concerns, things like that. So if you can't think of it now, by all means, I'm pretty accessible. People know where to find me pretty easily. So. Thank you. Well, that, uh, Dave, with that, I'm going to thank you for your time um, and let you go off to whatever else you have planned for this lovely evening here. Um, and, and in general, just to remind people, like, there's always so many things going on in our neighborhood. And I think as we see these little kiosks pop up, it's a, it's a reminder that, you know, this is an effort to continuously connect us to all these other parts of St. Paul in like a purposeful, um, visible type of a way. Yep. I was going to hang on, listen to Max's talk about the master plan. So I'll just go uh, turn off my camera here and watch. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. All right, Max, you're up. Great. Well, thank you for the, that handoff, Dave. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Max. I am a relatively new hire with the city. I've been here for nearly four months, and a lot of that time has been spent working with Dave on both his Grand Round and Como Trail project. So as a cyclist and St. Paul resident, I couldn't be more excited about being involved with both. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce the Como Trail Master Plan to you all. Let me bumble through my screen sharing for just a moment and let's see, hopefully that's showing the right one. Yes, okay. All right, so um, the City of St. Paul's Parks and Rec Department is going to be engaging community members to inform and develop an updated trail master plan for Como Regional Park. The master plan will emphasize improving the connection between the trails within the park to St. Paul's Grand Round Trail Network. The process will prioritize connections around Como Lake, picnic pavilions, McMurray Fields, and outdoor classroom areas over those within the zoo, conservatory, or golf course areas. So uh, we're going to be, again, aiming to connect things mostly around Como Lake uh, with the Grand Round North Regional Trail. Uh, we're also planning on implementing a survey uh, to ask community members and ensure that their voices are engaged and incorporated in the design of the project, uh, particularly those that are historically underrepresented in city building projects. So um, the questions will have a focus on trail conditions and signage use generally, but we also want to make sure we're asking relevant questions to the respondents. So uh, with that, the survey will also be using context sensitive follow ups to keep respondents engaged in providing some student feedback. So um, in our process of sort of developing these items, we're also aware and consulting the recommendations made by District 10 um, earlier in 2020 uh, and kind of using that to inform both sort of the survey process and the materials we'll be presenting uh, that will be public facing shortly. So. I, I think the scope of this is, is we're, we're interested in finding responses that uh, are, are taken from, again, that, that 2020 D10 Land Use Committee report, uh, citing trails, amenities, and signage use areas for need in the park. Um, here you see that color-coded, sort of five color-coded areas of Homo Park that we're focusing on, uh, but the majority of the project will be focused around Lake. Um, 
so we'll be building on previous plans and proposals for the area, uh, existing physical assets, as well as, again, soliciting that feedback received from the community engagement. So the plan of this is ultimately to clarify pedestrians, uh, bicycle and mixed users throughout the park, and to, again, improve that connectivity between the Grand Rounds and Tacoma Regional Park Trails. Um, so we do have sort of a preliminary timeline drawn up. Um, I should also mention that we have funding secured through June of June 30th of 2024 through the Parks and Trails Legacy Grant. Um, that's going to allow us to work through this summer, fall, and throughout the course of next year, moving along the master planning process of you know development, drafting of documents, uh, engaging the community, and finally having an open house next fall, um, with an aim of having the master plan wrapped up and approved by the end of next year. So I know that's a lot of information all at once. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, and I hope Dave's still around to help me out if I need any. So thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, I'm going to jump in with a question. I know that these master plans are created um, every so often. And I'm wondering for this one, how long is it in effect then as like the guiding plan for the area? That's a really good question. You know, our master plans, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to tell you the wrong information, but I think typically the goal is 10 to 15 years. I mean, some of them run longer than others, but, you know, at some point, master plans become irrelevant and we're all aware of that. So, you know, I think it's actually different in each area. Um, but, you know, once, once we do find the need to update an existing master plan or you know develop one that's entirely new um then we usually aggressively start to pursue funding for that so i know it's not a straight answer but and i wish i could give you one <laughs> yeah no that's okay i but, ask because yeah. over the years um we have had we we with some regularity have people come um, to D10 or to land use and they're like we want a dog park in Como Park and um, and so you know periodically we try to start pushing on like where who do we talk to about something like that and what we typically hear is that you know that's not in the master plan or it's not part of the Met Council's um, you know 10-year vision for this area uh, and so it's it's not something that can be discussed and so I'm thinking about things like that where mm -hmm. in the past I know what we've, the feedback we've gotten is, you know, X idea isn't feasible because it's not in the master plan. Um, and so I always am curious about what those timelines are and how one gets things on the master plan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, oftentimes the best time to do it is as soon as, you know, the engagement starts. Um, we have had opportunities though in the past though to update um said master plans i mean this is part of an update of an existing one as well but um it's ultimately it's just a lot harder to get an item constructed in a park if it's not on a master plan i think um i think you know the city council views those as a, an already um vetted plan and from the community of what they want in the park so you know in order to get something different from that it can be pretty tough but it's not impossible yeah thank you dave um and go ahead yeah it's probably not your job dave but um 10 and 15 years is a long time to look at a plan for an area when things change so rapidly and people move and are transient and which then in turn means the needs change. So I, I guess my suggestion is that that's a long period of time and that it should be a bit more fluid than that. Yeah, I mean, and I don't disagree with you, you know, and I think that um, conversations like that need to be had more often, you know, it's like, so if there's, you know, areas that just don't work anymore, um, there can be a push to update these and you know, that's one of Park's goals is to try to stay as relevant as possible. And, you know, we understand that, you know, I mean, look, I mean, not everybody, baseball is still very popular, but not as popular as it used to be, you know. So 
a lot of a lot of times we're transitioning from baseball to soccer fields or you know and that's just one example i mean um but you know oh i don't know how long ago but right now we're putting in a bunch of cpac tack rock courts you know it's something that you wouldn't have seen 10 years ago but it's you know interests change and when when people like move into communities we want to provide items that people want to visit the parks for yeah, thanks, Dave. Other questions that are out there? All right. Well, we always have lots of ideas flying by land use. So for Dave, for Max, I assume that you will hear from us in the future um, as some of those suggestions roll by our door here. Um, if there are no additional questions, I'm going to thank our guests. Uh, you can unshare your screen whenever you're ready. Um, and I would just like to thank you guys for taking some time to be with us tonight, Max and Dave. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Nice meeting all of you. Yeah, you too. Um, we're going to move on in our agenda here. And I, uh, I, I see that we have lost Sophia, um, who was here to talk with us a little bit about the, the stop sign by her house. Um, and so I think actually, I, I think I can give you guys a little background, but the first thing I'll ask is, are there any other neighbors near Sophia um, who are here to kind of talk about this topic of some traffic calming on Hoyt Avenue? Well, I'm not here to speak specifically about that um, and really hadn't been super familiar with uh, the issue that she was talking about, but I'm generally in, in favor of that kind of um, traffic calming policy. Um, and so I, I'm in favor of anything that we can do to kind of implement things along those lines, even if I'm not speaking on specifically what mm -hmm. you want to talk about. Yeah, I appreciate that, Chad. Um, and I think that, you know, for those of you who are relatively new to land use, this is like a relatively perennial topic that comes up when we have some area of the neighborhood that really, for whatever reason, um, starts to sort of experience uh, traffic or, um, you know, new neighbor, new traffic through the neighborhood in a way that, you know, impacts what we would say is like quality of life. Uh, and in those situations, you know, we're sort of the first stop to try to talk with the city transportation department, figure out, you know, who the road belongs to. Is it the city? Is it the county? Is it the state? Um, and we've got all of them here running through Como. Um, in this case, so uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background, this email that Sophia had sent, um, there was a, some cars that were sort of chasing each other down Hoyt. Um, there, they were shooting at each other. Some of the houses around um, that intersection like Pascal Horton uh, on Hoyt, you know, caught some of that flack uh, in the front of the houses. And, and so the thing that she had been asking about is like, how do you slow cars down so that's not an attractive place for cars to kind of behave that way? Um, and something that we hear a lot about in land use is, is not necessarily that stop signs do the trick or stop lights always do the trick, but that that more broad idea of traffic calming. So that's things like um, bump outs on the curb, uh, painting on the street itself. Um, sometimes it's things like signage. Sometimes it's things like uh, plantings around the area. Something that gives people the perception that this is not like a wide open runway for them to fly down in their cars. And so that was kind of the conversation that we were having with Sophia. Um, it turns out that Hoyt is a little bit of a peculiar problem for us because we share that street with Falcon Heights. Uh, and so we don't necessarily have full autonomy over what is there. So it's unlikely that something like a stop sign will get put in. It doesn't meet um, some of the city's requirements for spacing distances between other controlled intersections. But uh, for those of you who might have been around land use a few months ago, we had a discussion about the safe routes to school options around Chelsea Heights Elementary. Um, and so we are hopeful that kind of as the development of plans around Chelsea Heights, kicks into gear that we can use that as an opportunity to talk about some of those more significant calming measures um, in a kind of a long Hoyt there. Um, I just wrote over, I'm somebody who lives a block off of Hoyt and I always ride my bike up Hoyt to the fair and it's always like, 
all right, I hope I don't get run down today. Um, you know, it is, it's a, it's a bit of a thoroughfare for us. So, um, I, you know, she's not here to talk about it, but just so you know, that's sort of the action direction that land use is taking is trying to find a way to take the request um, from these neighbors and kind of move it into a space where we do actually maybe have a little bit more control. Yeah, Anne, go ahead. Um, me again, I live on Victoria, speed limit 25 miles per hour, bump outs, plants, none of that works. So I'm gonna actually suggest some enforcement. And I know we've thrown out speed bumps and there were differing opinions as to whether the city allows those, although I have seen them in some other neighborhoods, but what is being suggested doesn't work. And yeah, I sympathize. I ride my bike to the fair too, up white. And yeah, it's either a pothole that's going to do me in or somebody not paying attention to their driving. So, but it's got to be addressed on more than just Hoyt. And I'm going to say that on behalf of everybody who lives here on Victoria Street. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I have seen people fly through there as well. And I, I think, you know, there's a limited number of tools in the tool chest. And so we get to a point where we're sort of like, what? can we throw at it? Um, you know, I live on Chatsworth in Montana and my, my neighbors and I have all put those little green guys with their flags. Um, just, we've got like five houses that have them. We kind of line them up on either side of the street. So that's the gauntlet that people have to run their cars through. Uh, it slows them down sometimes, but not all the time. So we certainly, uh, you know, it is a never ending battle. So with that, um, I am going to just kind of run through a couple of additional updates for us. Uh, for those of you who have been here over the last couple of months, we've been talking about um, some of the CIB funding um, and Como Park. So this is in the in the agenda if you want to click on the link there. Uh, but Como, the Como Park project did make it into the final recommendation um, for that uh, community in the in the CIB community proposals that doesn't necessarily make sure or make certain that that's going to get funded um, but this is some of the additional lighting and safety measures that we've talked about over the years around Como Lake we know that we can put in all the lights we want that doesn't stop people from stripping out the electrical systems in there so we can't necessarily keep the lights on but we can keep the infrastructure there so we can just keep refilling <laughs> those uh, those wires inside of those big light tubes, but I just wanted to update you guys that that one did make it through the final cut there. Um, the other thing that I want to put a call and request out for um, for for D10, um, another one of the big citywide events that we really put some muscle behind uh, is the citywide drop-off event that happens at the state fairgrounds. I, uh, Shevik has put the volunteer sign up there in the chat, and I would strongly encourage you to see if an early or a late shift uh, volunteer gig on Saturday, September 17th might be in your future. Um, if you volunteer, you do get to drop off your items for free. It's very attractive. Uh, so if you have things like electronics, um, mattresses, uh, stuff like that, that you want to Get rid of and don't want to pay for it we deeply appreciate uh some of the volunteer help that we can get to make that event happen um just as a, a note that the i say there's an early and a late shift but the early shift is like 7 30 to 10 and the late shift is like 10 to 1. so you you only lose half of your saturday uh it is a usually a pretty entertaining um some days very wet but uh, often we've had beautiful weather um, you can see all kinds of weird stuff that people bring through. So uh, as a volunteer coordinator, I thank you in advance for signing up on that sign up sheet and giving us a hand. The other thing that I want to plug is the weekend before that, September 10th, uh, Como has, or the Como Community Council has our, our final um, like hyper local neighborhood event of the season. That'll be our harvest festival in Tilden Park. Uh, so that is the afternoon of September 10th. I think that there's like a pie contest. Um, and so we kind of are trying to slowly make our way around to all the different areas in the neighborhood. Our hope is also to use that opportunity to touch base with some of our neighbors who will have just recently survived another state fair season uh, and the crush of all of the people that that brings and kind of start to collect some feedback from them as well. 
Um, there's a few other upcoming events, the tree trek, another lake cleanup. Um, this is our first trial of the land use meeting being right before the community council board meeting. So typically all of our community, our committee and our board meetings have been on separate days. We are looking for ways to engage more people to make it easier for people to make space for attending these meetings in their schedules. So this is the first trial through December. We will have uh, our land use meetings from 6 to 7.15 just before that board meeting. That board meeting kicks off at 7.15 and it does so in this very link. So all you need to do is hang out and stay put. Um, I'm cognizant of giving Shevik uh, five minutes here to take off his land use hat and put on his full board meeting hat here uh, and get us set up for the next part. So I'll just ask if there are any additional questions before we call our meeting to a close tonight. 